My name is Robin Miller. I am the host of Miller Chat. This is my first show of the year for 2024. As I have three more shows to do before I officially retire on May 7th, 2024, after being on the air for 25 years. Wow. Yeah. I don't feel a day older. Or maybe I do. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so anyway, my host today, my guest today is uh, Lisa Shea. She is the author of 500 plus uh, works, an artist, a painter of watercolors and sinopops, entrepreneur and photographer. Did I cover everything? That sounds great. Thank you. That's a mouthful. <laughs> wow. I like to stay I busy. Can I can tell. I can definitely tell. Well, today we're going to talk about a couple of your new books that you wanted to just bring up. So tell us about what uh, what kind of books do you have now for the new year that you want to talk about? All right. Well, the one that is the most popular right now, because we started a new year, is the one that's on vision statements and time planning. So that is free on Amazon. So anyone can download that. And it's on Barnes and Noble and Apple and all the other platforms too. So whatever platform someone wants to get in on. And I think it's important when we start a new year, or I suppose at any kind of new cycle, to think about where we're investing our time and if we're investing it in things that actually matter to us. Because I think a lot of people get caught up into ruts and doing things because they're habit. And then they'll say to themselves, oh, I want to publish a book, but then they never actually make time to take even small steps towards that. So a lot of what the book talks about is ways to help you make progress towards things that are important to you. You know, I just saw somebody, I saw another <laughs> fur tail. Yeah, so yeah. Why don't you introduce your co-guest? I got two of them. They're siblings. So Felix and Zuzu, a brother and sister. So they like to come help. <laughs> oh, of course they do. Well, they're just, just what are you, they're your co-guest, I guess. Yes, my yes. co-guest. Exactly. So you wrote a book on um, uh, goal setting mm -hmm. and planning. Yeah. Um, and I know those are executive functioning skills because I'm an academic coach for a college. Mm -hmm. And so how did you get to develop it? I mean, it's based on what you've done or research. Are there resource uh, sources in the books that you wrote? Yep, I've done quite a lot of studying over the years because I run a variety of large websites. And one of the sites has 300 editors that work for me. And I have to try to keep them all uh, working on their projects and help them reach their own goals. So. Um, I did a lot of research on different cultures and how they approach goal setting and tried to distill it down into a core mm -hmm. set of information to help uh, most people be able to find their way. And a lot of people tend to go about it saying, okay, what am I going to do this week and approach it from a bottom up point of view. But it really helps so much better if you start from the top and say, what are my goals in life? You know, I want to be a writer or I want to be an artist or something, you know, a, a nice long-term one and then break it down mm -hmm. into closer points of view. Okay, well, if I want to do that, what should I accomplish over this year? What would I like to have, you know, by December 31st as an achievement? You know, maybe I want to be able to draw portraits well or draw cat mm -hmm. pictures well or whatever it is. And when you work on it backwards like that, then you can bring it down to something close up. Okay, so what can I do this week? Maybe I can sign up for an online course or maybe I can just research online courses and see what my options are. And that makes it easier to approach your project. I think so. I think um, I think a lot of people can use how to goal set and mm -hmm. how to plan ahead because a lot of people, uh, and, and you know, hypothetically speaking, based on the research, a lot of people have their head, their heads in their hands mm -hmm. in a lot of things. Yep. Yep. Multitasking. Mm -hmm. Probably nothing new, but I think electronics just make it a little more complicated. Oh, sure. If your phone is like binging every five seconds, it makes it hard to even think about doing something that has consequences a month from now. So, yes. Yeah. And I also noticed you wrote a book, a new book on uh, yoga. Tell me a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Yep. I've got five different books on yoga. So uh, yoga for uh, when you only have a short period of time, yoga when you've got a half an hour to an hour, chair yoga if you're not good balance so that you can't stand up. Bed yoga, if you're bedridden or if you just have such severe balance issues that even sitting in a chair is a challenge. So there's always a way to do yoga, no matter what your challenges are, as I think is my message. A lot of times we see on TV people twisting themselves into pretzel shapes and we say, mm. oh, I could never do that. 
But especially as we age, balance is really important because mm -hmm. if you fall and break a hip or something, you know, that can be a multi-month recovery. So even if you just approach mm -hmm. it from, I want to be able to walk safely in the ice to my car, <laughs> it's good to do um, very simple exercises to help maintain your balance so that you don't fall. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, I usually go walking every week with a friend. Mm -hmm. We do a fur meetup with our dogs. Yep. And uh, today's Thursday, January uh, 18th. But yesterday, after the s snow and ice, it was just not cool to go on the ice on the on the streets or the sidewalks. Being an yep. older person, not that mm -hmm. old though, but I know if I fall, my dog is going to continue walking like <laughs> sliced bread and say, oh, I'm, I'm free, <laughs> while my owner is trying to get up on the ice. <laughs> so it, it hurt actually as you get older the injuries can become a little more uh sufficient and very painful oh sure because our bones get more fragile so yes it's it's useful for all sorts of reasons you know you don't have to do an hour of yoga just five minutes to help um build your balance a little better it can make a big difference because then you don't trip and fall when you're walking down the sidewalk yeah i think it's really important to do that now are you a yoga instructor is that how you wrote it? No, I've been doing yoga for many, many years, and I've worked with a number of different instructors. And we're lucky that we have Kapalu, which is a yoga center out in the Western Massachusetts, which is a place that people from all over the country come into because it's got such a reputation. So I'm able to go there and benefit from the teachers there. Oh, cool, cool. Now, these books that you wrote, did you do it all at once or did you space them out last year? No, I spaced them out, and not all of them were written last year. The chair yoga was written recently because that's a uh, thing that many people have been asking me about. But the main yoga book was a couple of years ago, I think. I revise them every year, so every year I read all the latest research and go back and add in additional tips to make sure that it's safe and accessible for everybody. Because everyone has different challenges, and it's important, you know, even if you have arthritis or other kinds of challenges, you still want to build your balance as best you can. Now, I know you mentioned go planning. Do you have any particular tips that you want to suggest to our viewers who are listening or will listen? Well, I start the goal planning book by saying, see if you can just meditate for five minutes or breathe deeply for five minutes, because we get so stressed out that even the thought of trying to figure out goals can be stressful. And then we never get to it because we don't want to deal with the stress. So if you can find a way just to breathe and center yourself for five minutes and then think, what are five things that I'd like to get done you know, in the next year, we'll say, we'll try to make it easy. It can help you uh, really focus in on the things that are important to you. And once you have a goal in mind, then that helps you uh, work backwards and find steps to make it towards it. And like I said before, you don't need gigantic steps. If you want to learn how to write, then you don't have to jump right into I'm going to write a book. You can start with, let me find a website or a YouTube site that seems useful to me. So mm -hmm. you could just spend the first two weeks researching websites and researching YouTube people to find something that speaks to you. Well, you know, it's interesting to say that there was um, there's been books on different habits, but basically mm -hmm. it, it, people have to learn a new habit. And one of the books I read was Tiny Habits. Mm -hmm. And that deals with, and I use this when I coach students, uh, we talk about tiny habits not being anything major, Mm -hmm. It could be the tiny stuff, for example, um, if they want to study. And, you know, people like planning. You get stressed about planning. You get yep. stressed yep. about wanting to study. You get stressed about going to the grocery store, mm -hmm. right? Walking the dog, eating, right? Mm -hmm. And that gets in the way of what you want to do. So I say, what about if you just do it for five minutes? And they're like, mm -hmm. five minutes? <laughs> I'll try it. So some do, and then some say, you know, I could do more than that. I could do 15. I said, well, mm -hmm. if that works for you, that works for you. Yep. You know, I mean, the famous one is when the doctor says to the uh, client who wants to lose weight, I have a treadmill in my house. So the doctor says, well, just for one week, take a chair, a cup of coffee and sit by the treadmill for a week. Yep. And they're like, well, that's really ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> no. And then after another week, get on the treadmill and just stand mm -hmm. on the treadmill for five minutes. Yep. So after a while, they feel sort of weird mm -hmm. so you, and you reward yourself after you do it 
well, and it's building comfort levels with it. You know, if it feels stressful to get on the treadmill and walk, because what if it throws me off or I trip or something like that? At least if you start to feel comfortable that it's a part of the household that's not scary, then that makes you braver to take the next step. So yes, I'm all in favor of little tiny steps and eventually they'll add up if you have set yourself a goal in the, in the distant future that you want to work towards. Right, and you have to develop patience, as you know. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And that's basically it. So tell me about the breathing. Where does that okay. come into play with all this? Well, the um, book a lot that you of, wrote on. Yep, yep. So I have a book on slow breathing and there's been a lot of research coming out recently talking about the benefits of slow breathing. And the thought is that we live in a society that is often very hyped up with anxiety with nowadays anxiety. with um, mm -hmm. phones binging and TVs having people arguing with each other and all that other kind of stuff. So we just have stress ramping through us all day long. And when you breathe slowly, you're telling your body that it's a time that you can relax and that you can have the stress hormones reduce in your body. And then, you know, stress hormones cause all sorts of other cascades of unhappy events. So. Once mm -hmm. we breathe slowly, just the act of breathing slowly reduces stress levels, reduces the stress hormones and helps our memory improve, helps sleep improve. So it has this whole cascade of effects. A lot of people are challenged because they'll try to breathe slowly and after 30 seconds, they'll get distracted and be thinking about TV shows or cooking lists or other things. Yes. And part of the, the thing that we need to learn is that it's okay that our brains just get distracted and even just doing it for 30 seconds is helpful. And the more you practice doing it, the more you'll be able to get better. Sort of like your treadmill example, you just have to start it. And if you start for 10 seconds or 30 seconds, it's a start. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, actually I read a book last year. It was written by a woman in England. Mm -hmm. so the 50 type of ways that you can walk mm -hmm. or what you could do on a walk. And she was one of them was, and everything is all research based. Yep. Every article. And it talked about how we should breathe in through our nose. Mm -hmm. If we don't breathe in through our nose and breathe out through our mouth, if breathing in through the nose, and I get it, people are able to do this, um, it helps clear out their sinus passages. Mm -hmm. So I started to nose breathe more because we're not nose breathing. Mm -hmm. Yep. That and a lot. Uh, yeah. And I think that's if you can do it. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody's different. Right. Yeah, like you said, it's it, it's really important. So wellness is basically one of your specialties when it comes to writing books. Then. Yes, I try to write a lot of books on topics like this because it doesn't cost money. You know, my books are out there for free. And then if you want to slow breathe, you don't have to buy anything at all. You don't have to buy special equipment and you don't have to be anywhere special. You know, you could say for yoga, you could do yoga in bed, but let's say that you wanted to do floor yoga, then you need like a space on the floor and you probably mm -hmm. want a mat to cushion you. But with slow breathing, you could sit anywhere and just for 10 seconds, you could breathe slowly and it has researched effects, positive effects on your body and your mental state and everything else. So a lot of my aim is to provide tools to people that help their lives get better. That doesn't cost any money at all. Well, it makes sense. I mean, even people count steps, and I tried that mm -hmm. one time. Yep. And I'm like, oh no, I, I said, nah, I, I, no. That was one of the texts in the book on the 50 mm -hmm. different ways to walk. Yep. But that, that, that people, it's like uh, walking meditation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I have a book on meditation, uh, and it, and the same thing. You know, some people love counting steps because it makes sense to them, and other people hate it for whatever reason, and other uh, forms of walking meditation work better where they focus on the bird songs or they focus on nature around them or whatever it is that appeals to them. I, I like the thing called um, animal meditation. Mm -hmm. And I read that. And again, it depends how you interpret it. Some people look at it as where well, they're meditating, petting their pooch, mm -hmm. petting the kitty. Yep. Um, it, I mean, I know a dog could stay still. It's just a cat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, the cat take, remember the cat, you take, they take a message mm -hmm. and the dog comes when they're called most of the time, but, <laughs> or, or, um, you know, or walking with your animal, mm -hmm. walking with your dog. Yep. So I read some new stuff on that about, as they know, petting the animal makes people more relaxed. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think for dog owners, it's a, you know, a multiple win, 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 because it gives you incentive to go out and get walking, which is good for your body. And it's generally relaxing, which is good for your brain. 
and it gets you out in the sunshine. And so many studies now are showing that a lot of our problems with eyesight, because I also wear glasses normally, um, is caused by a lack of sunshine. They used to think it's because we read too close or that we read in the dark or all these other kinds of things, but they're turning out now that it's because we're inside so much that we're not getting enough sunshine and our eyeballs are actually deforming. So uh, dog walking yeah. is hugely important. Oh yeah, I mean, doing a botanic uh, the pandemic, which has been four years, by the way, yep. ago, a lot of teenagers fell apart because they're not going out. Yep. Yep. You know, I walk in the neighborhood, I'm like, where are the kids? <laughs> you know, in our generation, we went out and did something. We found something to do. Mm -hmm. But a lot more younger people need to learn. They need to get out. Yep. If they're able to, and if they're healthy to do. Right. So that's really important. Um, so shifting gears a little bit. Um, I know that you wrote a book about an, a protagonist with Asperger's. What's the title of that book? So there's actually a series of 10 of them right now, and I'm mm -hmm. working on the 11th. So the Diner Deeds Done Dirt Cheap is the first one, which is a play on a song title. And then Diner Days Are Here Again, which is another play on the song title. So all of them have some sort of a fun association with them, but they're all based on Worcester lunch car diners, which were built right here in Worcester, Massachusetts. The factory where they were built is right across the street from the Miss Worcester lunch car, which is on uh, Quinsigamond and Southbridge. Quinsigamond oh. and Southbridge, I think. Yes. So if yes. you're at that intersection and you're looking at the Miss Worcester diner, right behind you is a brick building, and that's where the all the diners were built from the Worcester Lunch Car series. So they are all locally built and there's um, a couple of them left in existence. So far I found 10 around Massachusetts. So I go to each one and take a bunch of pictures of it and uh, take notes about it. And then I write a mystery set in that spot. Have you gone to the diner on Shrewsbury? On yeah, there's two on Shrewsbury Street. Yeah. So I've been, they're, they're yeah. actually right across the street from each other. So yes, I've been mm -hmm. to those two. They're both a lot of fun. You know, I was looking over your book, and I've I've been to that Bovalaw Diner. Mm -hmm. Actually, when I first came to Worcester in nineteen ninety three for a job, um, you know, I was new and I was driving around with my husband, and Bovalaw Diner was one of the diners we went in. Oh, great! And I haven't seen a steel diner in a very long time because I was from New York, mm -hmm. and I knew New Jersey has a lot of diners, but I don't mm -hmm. see that many steel diners. Mm -hmm. Yep, there were a couple of different vendors that made them, and Worcester Lunch Car Diner was just one of them. And be, probably because it was in Worcester, we have a couple of them around, like Ralph's um, is the Chadwick Diner. So uh, yes. a number of places in the area have those old traditional diners. There's one in Whitensville, which is Peg's, which is right on the main, uh, I think it's Church Street in Whitensville. So you actually do go to the diner? Yep, yep. So we go to the diner, we eat at the diner, and then I write up some sort of a mystery story that's set there. And do they know what you're doing, the owners? Well, I usually don't tell them while I'm doing it because I don't want them to act any differently. But then you know, I'll let them know afterwards. Yes. Um, one of the ones I want to focus on is, I think you said an Aspire girl. Mm -hmm. yep, an, an Aspie girl. So Asperger's was a term for a um, portion of autism. And it's fallen out of favor because autism comes in so many different varieties and styles and every single person is different. So they didn't want to subset one particular group and say all of you people have Asperger's and everyone else doesn't have Asperger's. But at the time right. I was writing this, it was the term for, we'll say a category of autism where the person could live on their own and could communicate. So they were verbal in general and they were self-sufficient in general and they were often um, higher than average intelligence and at the same time, they had a lot of social challenges and were uncomfortable in crowds and uncomfortable meeting new people. And, and all of this is just in general, you know, every single person is different. But that was the type of heroine I was creating so that she would be able to go out on her own into these different diner situations. And she was uncomfortable being there, but she found a way to interact with people. Yeah, you wrote that she went like around 11 o'clock at night before the mm -hmm. ball crowd. Did yep, I read that yep. correctly? Yep. Well, counting steps. Mm hmm I picked that up. I had to read it again. I said, <laughs> oh, I get it. I get it. I get it. Uh-huh. How long did it take you to write? Oh, you know, I've been to the boulevard a couple times, so I already was familiar with them, but we went back out there again, and then probably a week or two to write the story. 
because I have a number of family members who are on various places of the autism scale. So it was a type of heroin I really wanted to write about. At the time, there weren't many stories that featured a main character with autism. And often, if a story had a person with autism, they were used sort of as a stock character that, oh, everyone feels sorry for this person. And that wasn't the way I wanted to present it. I wanted to present her as a, a main character. It's interesting you say that because everybody talks says says Rayman, Rayman, mm -hmm. and that's a stereotype. Mm -hmm. Yep. And when I when I look at the story now about being in an institution at the end, mm -hmm. I have to say that's a really offended offends <laughs> people mm -hmm. because when they wrote the movie, that's all they knew. They didn't think people with uh, autism could live in a community. Yep. Yes, it was. Good wow. in that it brought awareness to people about something maybe they hadn't heard of before, but then it was also challenging because of, like you said, all the issues they had with the stereotypes and what they said was the final pass for anyone who was in that situation. I shouldn't laugh, but it's just uh, frustrating. Yeah, so. and it was, it, even though Dustin Hoffman did win the Oscar, mm -hmm. he did. He did a good job. They yeah. only knew what they knew. Right. But I think in it, now people would, especially the uh, Gen Zs would probably not watch it or say probably the same thing that they're stereotyping right well and i believe it was daryl yeah. hannah who's the actress from splash who when she was young was diagnosed with autism and her parents told her doctors told her parents just to put her in an, an institution she'd never be able to do anything for herself and now she's a world famous actress because she found a way to you know cope with the different stresses that she had and to make a path that worked for her yeah what made you say Aspire? Well, it's Aspie. Um, people with Asperger's would call themselves Aspies. So A-S-P-I-E, really? just as a nickname for Asperger's. Yeah, so a number of my friends who have Asperger's, oh. especially the girls, would call themselves Aspies. Interesting. Hmm. I don't remember that. I know now that it's called along the spectrum. Yes, yes. Yes, a That's lot of the, the term that they use. Yes, a lot of the uh, wording has changed since I wrote the series. It's called a neurodevelopmental condition. Right, right, which is a good thing. It's good that we are always uh, updating and refining the ways that we discuss um, different challenges people have. Yeah, and I was reading about the diner, and you did have some characteristics, uh, characters of people who had different issues, and, and you really described them well. Oh, thank you. And you said that nobody, you say that nobody in that story is any particular person that you know? Correct. Right. I, I um, blend people together because I'm also on the board of Open Sky, which is a local organization or not Open Sky, Valleycast. Valleycast, which is part of Open Sky, which is an organization that works with people with various developmental disabilities and challenges. So I am often around people that have all of these kinds of challenges. And I would never want to write about one in particular, but I uh, take traits from a number of different people and sort of mush them together to form a single fictional character. Wow. Well, like I said, you definitely have a creative mind, an imaginary mind. Mm -hmm. You must sleep, eat, and dream about books. Oh, I definitely dream about books. There's many times, like I have a Scottish time travel series that I wrote that I woke up mm -hmm. and I had the whole dream in my head of the complete storyline. So I just sat there for the next three days typing it out. So sometimes mm -hmm. I'm lucky and my dreams just give me stories like that. And none has been made into a movie yet? No, but that's a funny thing. I got a spam message this morning saying that someone in Germany wanted to make one of my books into a wow. movie. And what was funny is that it wasn't, you know, this diner series or my Sutton Mass mystery mm -hmm. series or something that you could actually consider becoming a movie. It was my carb charts book, which is about what, how many carbohydrates are in different foods you eat so that you can eat more healthy, which clearly is not movie material. So no. I lost my chance of stardom. Well, you never know. That's true. You never know. Well, let you do a great job in marketing. So believe it or not, we have like three minutes left. So okay. what do you got coming up? I mean, I know you also do the Blackstone Art Center. Anything coming mm -hmm. up with that? Yep. Uh, the Blackstone Valley Art Association, our next show that we have starting in March is open to the community and it's all about local landscapes. So people can paint their local town hall or draw a picture of their local waterfall or anything at all that they want that's somehow related to local landscapes. So we'll put all the information out on Facebook and on the website and so on, but we'd love to see what people have to showcase about their local towns. 
Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, sometimes in the past, I've seen people that don't park in Worcester drawing. Mm -hmm. park. Yeah. I've yep. seen that. That's a beautiful yeah. park. I love the bridges in there. Yes. Yeah. And they made it handicapped accessible finally. Yes. Yes. <laughs> some things yep. come, you know, as, as we're talking about disabilities and challenges, some things come very slowly, but eventually they get there. Yeah. So you, you have the art festival, any upcoming uh, other events that you do for the well, community? Every second Thursday, we have a free meeting at the Sutton Library, which is a Sutton writing group. We've got about 80 members of it. So we mm -hmm. uh, welcome writers of all levels. So even if you're just thinking about writing a book or thinking and working something, we are here to help you in any way we can. And one last thing I wanted to catch up about. You said 300 editors. What do you mean mm -hmm. by that? I run a site called BellaOnline.com, and its purpose is to train primarily women who are uh, stay-at-home women that need to find a way to supplement their income. We teach them how to write content, how to market their content, how to do social media, and all that other kind of stuff. So, you know, each one has their own topic. We have someone on quilting, someone on I'm drawing a blank. Cats, someone on dogs, you know, so on different discrete topics. And we we teach women how to build their skills so that they can then, if they want to, go out and launch a website and make some money. Bella.com? Bella Online. So B-E-L-L-A online.com. Wow, that is awesome. Oh. Wow, you do a lot for the community. Well, it makes me happy to help people who maybe didn't have, you know, I was lucky to have a childhood where I grew up with computers. So I want to help other people uh, be able to reach whatever dreams they want to reach. I know they have, the, I don't know if they still have the Displace Homemaker organization. They had, they, I don't know if they still have it. They train people who are looking for skills to learn. Oh, okay. I hadn't heard of that. I'll take a look. Well, Housemaker has a different variation now okay. because of the gender. Mm-hmm. So it may be, some people call it domestic engineer. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Wow. I can't believe how fast this went. I mean, <laughs> we got one minute left. So what I wanted to do is, um, can you just say a website that people can contact you? Sure. They can go to lisashay.com where I should have links to pretty much everything that I do. And that should give you links to the Sutton Writing Group, which, like I said, meets every second Thursday of the month and the Blackstone Valley Art Association, which has meetings every month. And all of these things are free. So uh, these are all free ways to help you make progress. And then my books, if you just go to Amazon and search for Lisa Shea, then you could find I've got, I think, 50 different free books on there on topics like yoga and meditation and goal planning and things to help people make progress in their life. Hmm. Let's talk about forest bathing at another time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Uh, this has been another episode of Miller Chat. And I thank Lisa Shea uh, coming on my show, author of 500 Works, artist, painter, photographer, entrepreneur, for coming on my show today. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you very much.